Hello, my name is Olivia Holmes, and I teach medieval studies at Binghamton University. Hi, my name is Kate Travers, and I'm a PhD candidate in Italian studies at New York University. Would you like to begin by outlining the canto? Yeah, so um, today we're talking about Paradiso 31, and um, at this point, Dante the Pilgrim has arrived in the Rose of the Blessed in the Empyrean. And the highest point of heaven, which he entered in Canto 30. So in 31, he sees the true form of heaven. So the souls who previously appeared to him back on ascension are actually seen in their true place in the Rose of the Blessed. So the Canto culminates with Dante the Pilgrim looking upon the Virgin Mary with his new guide, Bernard of Clairvaux. Okay, so what strikes me here is that Dante is supposed to be seeing heaven in its true form at this point the souls in their true place. But because he's still alive, he still has to speak in terms of the senses. So he speaks metaphorically. Um, and it's it's a very mixed metaphor, especially the opening tercet, which I will read to you. In forma dunque di candida rosa, mi si mostrava la milizia santa che nel suo sangue Cristo fece sposa. So Dante sees the ranks of the saved in the form of a candida rosa, a white rose. Um, it's presumably a collage of the faces or bodies of the souls. Um, it's analogous to a rosone, the rose window in uh, Gothic churches. Um, in addition, Gianfranco Contini has argued that it's an anti-parody of the plucking of the rose at the end of Il Roman de la Rose. So um, it's also an image of the culmination of a sexual relationship, um, but the souls are described at the same time as a milizia santa. They are the army of the saved, um, that Christ wedded with his blood. So military and matrimonial. Um, he, Christ wedded it with his blood, the blood that he lost at the crucifixion, but that since this is matrimonial, it's also the blood of the consummation of a marriage at the loss of virginity. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all these things at once, um, but it's just like these things. They're not really what he's seeing. These are just metaphors that are approximations of what can't be described in words. Yeah, so very metaphorically rich, aren't they, those opening lines? So it, uh, one of the important things that happens is uh, Dante's guide, Beatrice, is replaced by Bernard of Clairvaux. Um, so Beatrice, she doesn't actually speak in this case, she has a lot of dialogue in uh, 29 and 30. She falls silent here as Bernard um, comes to take over. So a quick introduction to Bernard. He is associated with the creation of monasteries, with preaching in favor of crusading and against heresy, particularly Catharism. And he's also renowned for his influential role in developing something called Marian devotion, which is essentially the, the premise that the Virgin Mary should be worshiped as an intercessor for sinners, making Bernard really an obvious choice for this canto in which we uh, have the vision of the Virgin. Right. So this is a very important canto because it's the transition to Dante's third and final guide, even though we're close to the end. Um, it has a colpo di scena. Uh, it's very dramatic. Dante turns to ask Beatrice a question and he, instead of her, he sees an old man. Um, this is an echo of Purgatory 30 when Beatrice descends to the mountain of of purgatory and Virgil vanishes. Um, the sorrow that Dante experiences at the loss of Virgil is not repeated here. Beatrice is still there. He looks up to her and she smiles back down at him. Bernard tells him that Beatrice sent him a terminar io to, no, a terminar lo tuo disio. Um, he's there to fulfill Dante's desire and Dante looks up to see uh, Beatrice finally on her throne, um, uh, wearing a crown. Uh, she's making a crown for herself with, you know, her halo makes a crown. So she's very much anticipating the queen of heaven whom we'll see at the end of the canto. Um, 
Beatrice is, uh, excuse me, Bernard also earned his place here as the final guide. Um, as a mystic writer, he also wrote commentaries on the Song of Songs, um, in which he draws on the erotic language of contemporary uh, love poetry. So uh, Bernard refers to himself as, as, as uh, the Virgin's devotee, and he's sort of her courtly vassal in the way that um, uh, courtly love poets were, the, you know, the metaphorically the vassals of their beloved. Um, but here is where Dante says goodbye to Beatrice as an object of desire um, and transitions to the Virgil as a more adequate representation of his love for God. So what do you notice about the representation of the souls here in heaven? Yeah, and um, in our previous conversations, we were talking about how vision is a really key motif for understanding the representation of the souls in this canto. Um, so, one of the lines that one of the lines that makes this most apparent is um, the moment when um, Dante the Pilgrim looks upon Beatrice um, as she joins the Rose of the Blessed, and even as she's far away, uh, he still can see her clearly. Um, so. I'm just going to read to you line 73 to 76, um, where Dante describes the distance between the pilgrim and Beatrice as beyond all mortal scale. Da quella region che più su torna occhio mortanto non dista, qualunque mare più giù si abbandona, quando lì da Beatrice la mia. So no, no mortal eye, not even one, that plunged into deep seas be so at the highest thunder forms as there my sight was far from Beatrice. And that's the Mandelbaum translation of those lines. Thank you. Yes, the keenness of insight that um, Dante experiences in this canto is unprecedented. Um, his vision is unimpeded because there's no physical matter between him and the things he sees. He's outside of space and time, finally. He's in the cel che pura luce. So, as we were saying, he's beyond the mediation of the senses. In platonic terms, it's as if he has been looking at the shadows on the cave walls and he's finally turned around and he sees the real thing, but um, he still needs language to express it. Um, so he's gradually rising up and becoming more and more capable of sustaining this sort of vision, which is represented figuratively, I think, in. Um, in this canto, we move from Beatrice uh, smiling back down on him, so ride, to the virgins laughing at the um, angels, to um, the smile of Christ at the in the final canto. So there's this sort of figural, string of figural relations in which each prefigures the next. Um, and I think an important theme in this canto is is uh, again, figurative language as an approximation of experience, especially the language of courtly love we've been talking about, the, the language of the Song of Songs as a, you know, a metaphor for the individual's reunion with God, and also metaphors of the journey and of arrival. Um, so how do you see this as linked to our present situation? Yeah, I mean, as we've been mentioning, this canto um, is so much about representation. And I think we've all been thinking about perception and the way we're um, perceiving our new world in this very particular moment. And COVID-19 has forced us to acclimatize to uh, seeing loved ones at a distance. And for us, we're really seeing the people that we interact with most, the people that we, we care about the most, um, through virtual representations, um, like video calls, like this very video itself, right? And I think unlike the Pilgrim's experience, our uh, experience of um, seeing via a distance is via a digital uh, medium, but our sight, much like the Pilgrim's actually now traverses impossible distances too. Right, and I'm also struck by the proliferation of intermediaries in the canto, right? We have, we have Beatrice and then we have Bernard and then we have the Virgin and then we ourselves, you know, have, have a series of intermediaries in our vision. And there's this notion of sort of facsimiles, um, uh, representations in relation to the true object of desire and the longing for the real thing. So we are also distant from 
human contacts because of quarantines, because of separations, because of travel bans. And we use, as you were just pointing out, the mediation of screens and phones and social media and so forth. And there's a sense that in this canto is where we come out of that, right? Mm -hmm. The Empyrean is where we are coming out of quarantine, where we don't need these mediators anymore. Mm -hmm. um, or, or we won't need these mediators anymore. So, um, so what other themes do you detect in the canto? Yeah, so the motifs of journey and return seems to be pretty prevalent within um, this canto. So in Paradiso 31, we are reaching to, like, near the end of the poem. Um, so this is sort of towards the end of the pilgrim's journey through the afterlife. Um, and we can see that um, the pilgrim basically um, is likened to the so-called barbarians seeing Rome on, uh, for the very first time on his arrival into the Imperium. That's the um, image that's used to convey his amazement. Right, and in this simile, he then goes on to really sum up his own journey. He says, thus I came to the divine from the human to eternity from time. And then in a final dig at his native city, he says from Florence to a just people. This is the culmination of the homo viator imagery that started in Inferno One, the notion of life as a journey. And he, he follows up this simile with another simile of a journey. He says he's like, a pilgrim in the temple he vowed to visit. Um, and here we've got him in a church again. So the rose is sort of morphed back into an element of church architecture. And he's looking around so that he'll remember and be able to tell people again what he saw. Um, he says goodbye to Beatrice now. Uh, he makes reference to her having left her footprints in hell. So in a sense, she's made a journey as well. And then he says to her, tu mai tratto a libertade, l'anima mia fatta e sana. Okay, so you draw, drew me from slavery to freedom. So his journey is also a version here of Exodus, of the trip, you know, the Israelites tripped from Egypt to Jerusalem, which is allegorized in the Middle Ages to have all kinds of different meanings on both a personal and a collective le level. And here he talks about, you know, Beatrice herself as having liberated him from sin and from desire and ironically from desire for herself. Um, and then he, he oh no. Um, so what, where else do you see this metaphor? Um, so I think we have a similar kind of metaphor at um, line 130, uh, sorry, 103 to 108, where we get the metaphor of the Croatian pilgrim seeing the Veronica. Um, and that again is likened to the pilgrim's own experience of, of seeing um, Paradiso. And what we, I think, really come to understand at this point in Paradiso 31 is that the end of the pilgrim's journey does not coincide with the end of the poem, because of course the pilgrim hopes he will actually make that journey once again upon his eventual death. And that is the moment um, at which his soul may be reunited with Beatrice in, um, in the Roads of the Blessed. Um, and um, yeah, at lines 88 to 90, Dante the Pilgrim expresses this desire that he, for his soul to be piacente, right, to be pleasing to, to um, Beatrice. And I think you, Olivia, had remarked on how that um, really echoes the Lexus of, of courtly love, right? It's quite um, uh, almost an erotic image. And, and um, he has to say goodnight to Beatrice now, but he obviously only sees her from a distance and he's really thinking about how um, reunion is possible at some moment in the future. Right. I think that's really important, this um, emphasis on the circularity of the poem. When he arrives, actually, he's really in the same place. That is, he hasn't set out yet on the journey that he anticipates in the whole Divina Commedia. Um, and, you know, so um, we get to this final scene, Bernard encourages him to look up and see the Virgin. The Virgin's arrival is compared to a sunrise, which surpasses all other lights. Um, this is an echo of a courtly compliment. Um, it, it, it's, you know, a commonplace in, 
in courtly literature. It's also in Petrarch. The beloved is more beautiful than all other women, the way that the sun surpasses the stars. I'm thinking before Dante, there's an example in Cavalcanti's Shepherdess, who was più che la stella bella. Um, so it's both, uh, uh, you know, she's both the courtly beloved, but she's also herself, she's the Blessed Virgin Mary, so, who's allegorized by Christian interpreters as a gateway for the divine son, that is, she is the dawn at the start of Christ's eternal day. Um, interestingly, Beatrice is also in Purgatory 30 compared to a sunrise when she arrives. She is said to be a, a sunrise in a cloudy sky, which is, you know, which is shaded so the eye can sustain it. But now Dante's eyes are, have developed in such a way that they can sustain it. And Beat Mary's advent is in a, a clear sky. Um, so how do you link this to the our present situation? Uh, interestingly, I think this uh, moment is one of separation, right? And I think right now a lot of people are separated from people that they care about, the people that they see the most in, in their lives usually. Um, and obviously this particular separation is um, happening in order to enable the pilgrim to receive beatific vision in order to to be saved soul. Um, yeah, even at the moment of separation with the Asia, there is this thought, this possibility our return of reunion um, with the Athrisha in the roads of the blessed. So I think in, in that sense, I mean, COVID-19 has, has separated a lot of people from the people they care about the most. And the idea of reunion is, uh, I think, a theme that um, weighs heavily on people's hearts and minds right now. Hmm. And I think that's related to another important theme in the canto, which is the relationship between the individual and the collective. So we've got this movement here from separation to union. Until now, Dante has encountered historical figures in the ranks of the blessed individually. And now he's, you know, arrived at the top and he's got a vision of the collective whole in the rose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that that image of the, the Candida Rosa, um, as you say, Olivia, is really important in terms of thinking about um, collective identities in um, Paradiso, in the Empyrean. And this is this rose is almost like a, a geometric inter interpretation, a geometric outline of what um, the, the Empyrean really looks like, what the souls look like. Um, and here, the individual souls that Dante has previously encountered in uh, the Cantos of Paradiso, they exist together. Um, as one within this rose. Right, and interestingly, it's also described as a regno, as a kingdom, this is the city of God, right? This is the city of all the Christians, all the saved. Um, and as I mentioned previously, it's also, you know, this final union is also sexual. It's also metaphorically sexual as suggested by the mystic marriage imagery at the beginning of the canto. So there's a way in which, Eros is resolved into caritas here. It's somehow contained in it. There's a continuity between things that are contradictory. Here, sort of in the vision of all things, all the contradictions are resolved. Mm -hmm. um, so again, what does this have to do with the state of the world today? Yeah, um, I think, you know, in, in 2020, we, we are all being asked to consider our um, own relationships to collectives, um, our individual versus collective identities, right? It be it in relation to public health crises where our individual actions could um, lead to the infection of others, or perhaps in relation to systems of white supremacy, systems of systemic racism, um, where collective action really does provide a, a means to um, affect social change. Right, that makes a lot of sense. I think in terms of a number of pressing issues of the day, you know, as well, economic inequality, climate change, what the general hope is, or at least mine, is that the pandemic will be some sort of wake-up call in which we'll learn to think in terms of collective action, we'll, um, you know, learn not to just selfishly consider our own well-being and our own immediate gratification, and we'll look for ways to work for the betterment of, of everyone and the whole planet. Mm -hmm. So, um, on that note, thank you so thank much you. for this conversation, <laughs> and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.